as we all celebrated Mother's Day and thanked or hopefully thanked our moms for everything they've done for us, today we'll talk about why we can't thank them enough. Being a mother is tough and that's an understatement. Today we have in the studio someone who doesn't sugarcoat the concept of motherhood. I'm talking about Pallavi Ayer, author and award-winning journalist who's written her fourth book now aptly called Babies and Violence. Pallavi, thanks so much for your time. First and foremost, why this book? It is a far cry, a far cry from the usual like political reporting that you do, right? You yeah, reported... Yeah, exactly. No, it's definitely a break from the usual kind of global journalism that I do. And you've reported from Belgium, from China, China and, and Indonesia. Indonesia. Exactly. So the kind of stuff I usually write about both in terms of my books and my reportage is high politics, fiscal crises, you know, those kinds of things. So talking about family life, talking about babies, bylines, nipples, all of this can be seen as a bit of a break. Uh, and a bit of a change and of course as you said why did I do this and I think it was because when I had my first child the kind of uh, the shock and the isolation that I experienced um, convinced me that society as a whole was doing a kind of miserable job in preparing mothers for Correct. this change and that in many ways there was this sort of um, conspiracy of silence that set mothers up to fail almost because not my parents not my doctors not my peers nobody had really told me how it was going to be um, so you know in part it was to break this kind of interiority right. of family life and of uh, uh, of the domestic and of trying to kind of uh, stop this artificial separation that we've created between the public but, sphere but why do you think that private? is you know because this book is was literally like reading a diary that I did not write correct but the thing is like you said I needed this a year ago when I was pregnant Nobody prepares you, you're absolutely right, we're a society that is obsessed with babies. When are you having a baby? Why are you not having a baby? Why is so-and-so's daughter not having a baby? You know, but despite that, they, like you said, nobody talks about, we'll prepare you with which socks to get, which swaddling cloth to get, yeah. but not about how lonely and isolating it can be. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Probably there's a biological imperative. I mean, people want you to like actually go and have these babies instead of overthinking it and uh, possibly <laughs> delaying it. So I almost think that there's this sort of societal biological imperative to be a little bit quiet about it and not put potential mothers off but you know um uh, more than that, I also think that there's this sense that whatever needs to be learned just automatically gets transferred within families uh, and that there's no need to actually be sort of talking about this in the public sphere. And Except that mothers the mom had babies 30 years ago and they've right. forgotten everything. This is absolutely right. I mean, I don't know if this kind of concept was ever adequate, but it's certainly glaringly inadequate in 21st century India when increasing numbers of women don't live with constant access to their mothers in any case. Correct. And then plus the medical and technological fields have marched uh, on to the point where a lot of what they tell you is contradictory in fact to the advice that you might gain from you know your elders as it were which makes young parents even more confused correct all right talking about biological reasoning right you talk in this book about the need for parents mothers and fathers to equally divide this the burden of parenting right but at the same time you say that mothers have this visceral emotional connect to babies that fathers don't and there's this is very endearing bit where you talked about how your husband Julio would you know even eat the last toast that's there on the table if he wanted to which for you would just be unthinkable right so what are you saying are you saying that we women should just accept that naturally the larger burden of this will fall on us to be honest, I'm not absolutely clear and this book was partly an attempt to explore some of these. You know, where do these biological differences come and how much of it is sociological or cultural and learned? Um, I certainly went into it thinking that uh, it was going to be much more equal than it ended up ended up being. I came from a very sort of liberal, progressive, post-feminist background where these issues were supposed to have already been settled. My husband is from a similar kind of background, you know, like when I met him, he did the cooking, he's as supportive of my work as anybody else. So I didn't go into this thinking that there would be any kind of gendered uh, division that would rear up, but it did. Um, um, and um, I'm, I'm, not st I'm still not 100% sure where these come from. I think part of it is that right from the outset, I took on a, a greater proportion of a certain kind of work, which is essentially the human resources admin side of child rearing, the kind of maker of to-do lists, uh, the warrior in chief. So that although uh, I think my spouse is excellent in terms of spending quite a lot of time doing the physical aspects of parenting, changing the, you know, changing diapers, okay, Occasionally, even attending parent-teacher meeting, there's a certain way in which my mental space got invaded by motherhood, which yeah. does not seem to have happened, happened to him. Men, yeah. And so, it actually is more of a 
qualitative rather than a quantitative issue. It's the way that parenthood has felt for me as a woman as opposed to the way parenthood seems to feel for him. And that's very ineffable and difficult to actually put down in, in studies. So when you're talking about division of work, we often talk about the number of hours that somebody is cooking or cleaning yeah, yeah. or spending with the child, not how that the time actually feels and yeah. the mental space. So and we that give him a uh, spouse of the year award because uh, you've uh, put been up quite with it. Yes, <laughs> been quite honest in this book. Now, yeah. you know, people in India, countries like India, we would really be quite shocked when we learn that, you know, America doesn't have a paid, yeah. guaranteed paid paternity leave, right? But I just want to ask you a controversial question. Could it be possible that, you know, in a sense, a maternity leave actually perpetuates this, what you're talking about? Because for six months, because you're at home, you fall into the trap of doing the larger, taking on the larger responsibility. Yeah. And then when you go back to work, you just end up having to do both at the same time. Absolutely. You know, the, the cartography of who takes on what responsibility gets set pretty early on in the relationship and Correct. it's very hard to change Break these patterns it, yeah. later on. So, of course, if there's going to be one uh, uh, spouse who's taking on the bulk of this for the initial period of childcare, it's going to be hard to break that pattern. And also employers are always going to be more cherry of uh, somebody who's definitely going to end up being um, the person who ends up taking more time off. So it's extremely important that we look at leave, not as maternal leave, but as parental leave going forward. I think this is a very, very uh, big key Correct. to solving some of these issues. And uh, uh, lastly, um you brought up kids in Europe, you brought up kids in South Asia and you're Indian. So And China. And China. Yes. And now you don't need to have read uh, Bringing Up Baby by Pamela Druckerman <laughs> to know that European kids are just better behaved than mm. Indian kids. So what's the secret? Give us, give Indian mothers a tip. You know, I think that a lot of European mothers don't have the kind of extended uh, family support that we have in India and also we often have domestic help as well, at least amongst middle class Indians. And that means that European mothers need their children to be independent far more quickly than we need to. I mean, there's a, there's, it's, it's less possible to indulge your child in many ways mm. because the burden on the mother is way too much. So there's a huge emphasis right from the word go of making sure that children can feed themselves, dress themselves independently. Um, and I think that often accounts for some of these differences that we see in early early childhood. Thanks so much, Pallavi. Thank you for being honest. That's what uh, women need to do Thank for you, other Thank women. You for Thanks so me. much. I don't really give advice, but if you're going to have a baby, pick up this book. It'll <laughs> do you a huge lot of good. Thanks so much again, Thank Pallavi. you. Thank you for having me.